Hi, good morning. I always like to, I don't know, I like to see who's coming in. <laughs> Maybe I should introduce them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll do it again. Good morning and welcome. If you want to say hi in the chat, you you may do that. Might as well do a good morning from and from where you are um, in the country. I know some of you are around the country, so it's really great to have you. This time we're on Facebook Live. Um, so we're both doing Zoom Live and on Facebook. Uh, we are really glad to be back with you this morning. I am Clover Beal. I'm the co-pastor of Montview Church, in case you didn't know that, where you stumbled this morning. Um, and this is our daughter, Sophie Beal. She is a divinity student at Yale Divinity School, and um, we are so glad that she is with us this week again. And uh, Tim Beal, who my spouse, who is a professor of religion at Case Western Reserve University. Um, and again, uh, his area of expertise is Bible and culture and Hebrew Bible in particular. So um, I feel like I'm along for the ride this morning. We are focusing on poetry and I love poetry, but I've never had to do uh, you know, interpretive work. The poetry. But anyway, I'm going to have Tim uh, start us out for this session and then we'll we'll jump in. Good morning, Great. both both of you. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Clover. Good morning, Sophie. Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome back or welcome if you weren't here the, the first time last Sunday. This is a series on um, the art of prayer on prayer as a as an art especially a poetic art, I guess, is, is really our focus. And last time we looked at um, the, the biblical poetics of prayer and, um, and thought a little bit about that. That's recorded if you want to go back and, and watch that. If you didn't um, get a chance to before, it's easy to find on the Montview website. This time we're going to be focusing on contemporary poetry and um, uh, thinking about contemporary, exploring contemporary poems that are prayers, that are I, you kind of discourse, and an I speaking to a you, at least at some point in the poem. And sometimes these poems go in and out of that, which is interesting too. But we're continuing that conversation and thinking about, you know, what it, why does prayer have to be so beautiful? Why does it have to be so crafted if prayer is just asking as Karl Barth famously um, defined it. Um, what is it about the, the, the poetics and the craft and the art of prayer? Um, and so uh, what we'll be doing is um, each of us has a poem to share. And so we'll go, we'll start with Clover and then we'll go to Sophie and then to me. And each of us will screen share our poem, say a little bit about it and maybe about the poet depending and then the three of us will kind of talk about that. Um, and, and we'll just kind of, we've never tried this before. So we'll see, we'll see how it goes. All of the poems that we're um, looking at today are related in some way more or less to Christian um, tradition. So we'll be interested in how maybe biblical themes and motifs might be finding their, their, their way into these poems, but we're not really confining our, our interest to that in, in any way. We want to look at these poems on their own terms. I would suggest that we're looking at them as a kind of scripture. I mean, we all, we all know that, 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 that on the one hand, there's, you know, the, 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 uh, the Bible as scripture, but um, I think for all of us, there are other scriptures that are important to us, that are important to our faith lives. And, and that's part of what we're interested in, in thinking about here too. Um, and related to that, uh, I hope that we can kind of explore how, um, how poetic language is, to put it in a kind of semi-fancy way, constitutive of reality, that it is, it constitutes a reality, a poem makes a world and can make available an alternative reality, a different way of seeing and being in the world from, 
from what we take for granted as the real and the normal and all of that. Uh, Christian Wyman, who I'll talk a little bit about later, talks about poetry as adding to the stock of available reality. Um, and that means like available reality about the world, but also about God. I think a poem sort of constitutes God in a certain way, makes God available in a different way through the metaphorical language and all of that, and also gives us different ways of understanding our I-thou relationship with the divine and with the world. And so hope that we can kind of talk about that along the way. So our path, three poems, one each, and uh, we'll read them, we'll talk about the person presenting, we'll talk about them, we'll have a larger discussion. There's a chat, as you know, and you should feel free to um, contribute to that and be part of the conversation in that way. We'll try to keep an eye out on that as we go along, but we'll probably miss some things, but know that people are reading those while they're listening to us. So that's part of this conversation too. And at the end, maybe if we have a little time, we'll, we'll have a little more general discussion like that. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Clover and um, also, uh, share my screen with Clover's poem on it once it's time. Clover, you want me to go ahead and share that now or do you want to talk for a second first? Yeah, I'll talk uh, about uh, Mary Oliver for a little bit first. Okay. That sounds good. Um, so Mary Oliver, I know many of you love Mary Oliver, so it seemed like it would be a big miss to not have her as one of the three poems that we are um, talking about. Uh, for many of us, uh, Mary Oliver was a way into poetry. Um, for for those who those of us who were uh, maybe intimidated by poetry or um, you know, just, just were reluctant to get in and maybe someone introduced you to Mary Oliver. Um, you know, we, we joke that Mary Oliver is uh, the middle-aged woman's favorite poet um, because she speaks, uh, she speaks beautifully uh, to the natural world, but she also connects and evokes something about our human, uh, our human struggle to understand ourselves and um, and heard that famous line of what will you do with your one wild and precious life uh, has almost become uh, it's so familiar that it's almost become a liturgical phrase we were talking about it's almost scripture it's it's you we could add that to a line in a litany or, or um, you know, a, pr a prayer in worship. And I think people might, they'd understand that or they'd hear it, both men and women, um, but it's become part of the vernacular, I think, of, of many Christians, uh, many people of faith. But I want to start, Mary Oliver, you know, her poetry is very, um, well, it's very natural world. She, she delights um, and is astonished and, and is in awe of creation. And she has a relationship with creation, um, with, the, with the created order, um, living things. And she has been, it's been said that she is so simple in her metaphors, her language, it's almost conversational, that some more erudite poets and critics have criticized her She's, she has passed, um, she, in, she died in 2019, but critiqued her that she was simple. And yet um, Mary Oliver said that she, uh, that she believed poetry needed uh, to not be fancy, that it needed to be accessible. It needed to evoke a, a connection and a connection with all things. So I just wanted to start by not with the prayer, not with the poem that we're going to unpack, but but her her prayer or her poem called Praying. And I think it gets at kind of what she maybe a little bit of a, a paradox uh, about um, <clears throat> prayer and poetry. So praying it doesn't have to be the blue iris. It could be weeds in a vacant lot or a few small stones. Just pay attention. 
then patch a few words together and don't try to make them elaborate. This isn't a contest, but the doorway into thanks and a silence in which another voice may speak. So I found, I, I find it amusing and wonderful that, that uh, Mary Oliver talks about praying as something very simple. Don't worry about the language, just patch a few words together, but it's the most beautiful poetic prayer or, and poem about prayer. So that even though she says, just patch a few words together, it's said in the most eloquent um, way. So we will explore her very simple simple poetry as, as prayer. So we're going to focus on the poem called Thirst. And it is from this collection called Thirst. It is the poem that uh, of which her collection is named. These are 43 poems, I think, uh, published in 2006. And her poem Thirst comes from a, a, a growth into faith, she would call her coming to God time in her life. She came to faith later in life. Um, I think specifically after her longtime partner, uh, Molly Malone Cook, uh, died in 2005. And uh, Mary Oliver was moving from uh, a, a a connection and faith and, and uh, celebration of the natural world, which she never lost, but also into a relationship with particularly Jesus, with, uh, with God and uh, Jesus as she became Episcopalian at the end of her life, which I think is also not a, not a surprise because the liturgy is artistic and beautiful. Um, and I would think that as a poet, she appreciated that. So here's the poem called Thirst. Another morning and I wake with thirst for the goodness I do not have. I walk out to the pond and all the way God has given us such beautiful lessons. Oh Lord, I was never a quick scholar, but sulked and hunched over my books past the hour and the bell. Grant me in your mercy a little more time. Love for the earth and love for you are having such a long conversation in my heart. Who knows what will finally happen or where I will be sent. Yet already I have given a great many things away expecting to be told to pack nothing except the prayers which with this thirst I am slowly learning. And that's the last prayer actually in the collection that she, um, that they, you know, the way that they uh, put the collection together. So we'll just jump in. Um, again, Mary Oliver was, was daily, it was said that she went to the seashore. She, uh, she was born in uh, uh, Maple Heights, Ohio, which we lived in Cleveland for a long time. And Maple, Maple Heights is a very humble place. I wouldn't say exactly next to the woods or the forest, but I, I, I guess as a child, she did spend a lot of time outdoors. Um, Mary Oliver was later in her life admitted that she was sexually abused as a child and um, had, had a great deal of pain and suffering because of that. And so the creation or the natural world was a comfort um, to her and a place of growth and safety. I would say probably an exploration not only of the natural world but, a, but an exploration of her interior world somehow through her um, love of the, of the outdoors of creation. Um, so, we, so we begin this, she begins this poem I think for, uh, I think in the celebration, in the in the going out outside as she always did her daily walk, and so she another morning and I wake with thirst for the goodness I do not have. Mary Oliver also was was humble, um, and if we heard her speak once, she was the most unassuming woman, we heard her give reading in, uh, in Cleveland, and 
it's just interesting. I wake with the thirst for the goodness I do not have. So this posture of humility and um, the ego, almost the, you know, the ego in check, the ego, um, yeah, the ego in check in relation to this, this God uh, to whom she's praying. Um, and she, she talked about goodness in other poems, that she was half halfway there to being the person that she wanted to be, to being the good person she wanted to be. There are other ways that she said that in other poems. Um, so here's this shift in, in vision to herself and her desire to uh, be the goodness uh, that she does not have. And so she walks out to the pond and all the way God has given us such beautiful lessons. And so this, uh, this uh, immersion in the creation that becomes lessons from God, uh, that it is changed into an understanding of herself from the source of, of the, the creator. And then she says, uh, oh Lord, I was never a quick scholar, but sulked and hunched over my books past the hour and the bell. Uh, this is when the poem turns and it becomes an I you, the I thou. Um, if you see the beginning is adoration and praise and here's almost like a confession. I was never a quick scholar, um, but hunched over my books past the hour and the bell. She, she was earnest. She didn't graduate from college. She went to both the Ohio State University and Vassar College, but didn't, didn't complete either at uh, a degree at either of those schools. Grant me your mercy. A and grant me in your mercy a little more time. And here the poem kind of turns, the prayer turns to a petition. And she talks about mercy through many of her prayers that, that the connection she has for God is, is often God's mercy uh, in be merciful. Um, and so it's a, I just think that's an interesting shift. Um, I don't know if it's a shift, but, uh, but a view of God as it's back to that humility. You think of Mary Oliver as very humble in her, in her look and her posture um, in the world. She was very shy. She was very protective of her own life. Um, and yet uh, to still long for God's mercy and uh, to see that as the dynamic between her and this, in this uh, uh, relationship in faith. Um, so then love for the earth and I, this is my favorite line, love for the earth and love for you are having such a long conversation in my heart. Uh, and she had just asked, asked the Lord for mercy for a little more time. So it's almost like this long time, uh, coming faith, uh, in God, this new conversation, not only with, with, uh, the natural world, but now with this Jesus, she talks about earlier in this collection, um, that they are now becoming in conversation with each other inside of her. And so these two loves um, are beginning to take, uh, take root in a relationship um, in residing inside of her. Who knows what will finally happen or where I will be sent? Yet already I have given a great many things away. And I wonder, you know, is she talking about her 40 year partner, um, Molly? Has she released doubt or defensiveness or woundedness? Like what is it that she has given away? Um, and her uncertainty, what will finally happen is that death that she's speaking of. She died at 83 years old. Um, so this, you know, she was probably in her 70s when she wrote this. And then here she said, expecting to be told to pack nothing. And I think this is a reference to uh, the what Jesus has words to his disciples when he sends them out. And he says, pack nothing for the journey. In all three of the gospels, uh, the synoptic gospels, uh, Jesus says to his disciples, follow me 
and then sends them out and says, take nothing for the journey. So there's this undivided attention in this new uh, faith uh, experience. Expecting to be told not to pack nothing except the prayers, which with this thirst, I am slowly learning. And so again, is this thirst um, a new way of seeing what she has always loved, which was being astonished by creation. Um, and now she needs more time. And is the time that she needs uh, more time for dialogue, for conversation with this God, more time for goodness to be the person she wants to be, more time for this new life of faith. And remember, she says, I am slowly learning. And earlier she had said, I was never a quick scholar. So here she's still the student um, at the end uh, as, as her posture um, to the end of this, this poem. Um, and I, I, the, another poem that I love so much is E.E. E. Cummings. Um, I thank you, God, for most this amazing day. At the end of, of Cummings' poem, where he celebrates, it's kind of, uh, celebrates, it's like a Psalm 19, all of creation tells of the glory of God. He says, now the ears of my ears awake and the eyes of my eyes are open. And it's this movement also from the celebration of the natural order to, uh, to something personal, something in, inside has awakened. And I see this in uh, Mary Oliver's journey into faith as well. There you go. Tim and, you. Tim and Sophie, do you have uh, any thoughts about this? That was great. I. I um... I hadn't paid cl uh, close enough attention to realize how much it's sort of overlaying her recollections of being a student with herself as a student now, you know, in, in the world and how all of that sort of the, the student language at the top and bottom kind of central center mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. those favorite lines of yours for the love of earth and love of you are having such a long conversation in my heart, which is so mm -hmm. beautiful. Mm -hmm. I, I think there are a few lines in a poem that have resonated so deeply with me personally than the, than the lines, I have never been a quick scholar um, <laughs> to, uh, sulking and hunching over, over my books past the hour uh, and mm. probably the best prayer that I'm gonna say to myself forever is mm. grant me and your mercy a little more time. Um, <laughs> but, I know you. Yes, indeed. I and I think that's a really beautiful way to to put it. Um, that that you've kind of because at, at first when I read this, I kind of thought of that as kind of standing out separate in some ways from the. It felt like it jumped out, and then the rest was sort of, um, yeah, somehow distinct from those lines. But that mm. helps uh, put those things together. Mm. I was struck, I think, relatedly by um, the the I wake with thirst at, for. I awake with thirst for the goodness I do not have as being um, very, I've been thinking about everything through the lens of like, what is our reformed tradition? Um, like, yeah. is that theology? And I think that that mm. speaks to it um, really beautifully, that mm. kind of question of like being in conversation with um, the divine and with nature and like, and with ourselves and um, knowing that, you know, we're, we're broken and yet mm -hmm. like loved and part of creation, mm -hmm. which is loved by God. And um, yeah, I love this poem. Yeah, me too. Yeah, big, big shout out to this collection for those who want to, if you're in a journey of your own faith. Also, I just want to promote uh, the last uh, collection that she did in 2017 uh, is called Devotions and it is a collection poems from all of her works. Um, and it's a great Latin devotional. Actually. Great, thank you. Thanks Clover, thanks um, for sharing that. And, and we're gonna keep moving to make sure we have enough time. Uh, on to Sophie and Emily Dickinson and the, the first line of the poem that she's going to be reading and sharing is my period had come for prayer. 
Um, do you want to say something and then share screen or what do you want to do, Soph? Um, I can, sure, I can briefly say something, but you can also pull it up as I do that. That's okay. fine too. Um, so Emily Dickinson, like she also sort of, I was struck, I didn't know that much about Mary Oliver's background, really. Um, I know that you love her mom, but I didn't know that much about who she was. And I, I was really struck by actually how much, um, you know, despite the difference in time and context, but she and Emily Dickinson actually have kind of a lot in common, it sounds mm. like, in terms of their inner world and um, the sort of grappling and the things that they loved and the things that they were kind of struggling to make sense of. Uh, so Emily Dickinson, obviously, it's funny to think of her as a contemporary poet compared to biblical poetry. She certainly is contemporary, but um, mm. this poem in particular, as best as we can estimate, was written uh, around 1963, um, or excuse me, 1863. So <laughs> the year that the Emancipation Proclamation, what, like the final uh, Emancipation Proclamation was mm uh declared which um is sort of helpful context i think um emily dickinson like is is one of those uh sort of mysterious characters i think there's there's a lot um there's sort of uh some perceptions of who she was based on almost mythology that's been spread uh, kind of just disseminated over time about her because there's so much we don't know about her she didn't all we really have um from her are letters and poetry and you know some some mm. accounts from others of their interactions with her um but we kind of the popular culture understanding of her is that she was you know sort of a hermit like a shut-in highly very very shy very much kept to herself like never left there's sort of the the image of her in this this white dress that was the the famous kind of um uh yeah image of who she was but um she obviously had a very rich inner life she also i think exemplifies this sort of um you brought up being in conversation uh with nature especially was a huge theme for her creation mm -hmm. um as well as the world like what was going around her and the divine um, and that kind of it, it, that conversation changes a lot over time and mm -hmm. most things that you read about her um, say that the, the kind of emphasis is on her um, I guess you most people talk about her like she was a staunch atheist um, I mm. think a lot of that has to do with the fact with the context of what she was around there it was very much you know during this this period where um the the reformed religion it was very particular very congregationalist she was very familiar with presbyterians um mm. her context was western massachusetts in amherst which is where i you know m met her <laughs> is how i feel um and really fell in love with her work and that's kind of continued over the course of my life. I uh, went to Mount Holyoke College, which was her alma mater. Um, she was mm -hmm. only there for one year, but um, while she was there, she heard sermons from a female preacher every single morning when she woke up, which is also, you know, mm -hmm. wild really at that mm -hmm. time. And I think that we kind of underestimate um, mm -hmm. what, what that impact might have been. Um, so all that to say, she, at the time when she was younger, which is sort of what we still hold on to uh or to kind of it's like we um just froze her in time as if your faith mm. journey is just freeze she was very kind of you know compared to most um sort of a rebel i guess within her context like in terms of faith um you know she she's most famous for this this time when uh they were trying to what was it they they had a group of students and um they asked the students they put the students into categories and you know there was the saved there were the people that could be saved 
And then there were the hopeless. I, I think they were literally called the group of the hopeless. And, um, and there were like three of them and she was one of them. <laughs> um, they, they, they classified her that way. And she sort of, you know, she was a little bit defiant and she was just like, well, that's just, you know, how it is. Um, mm. But, you know, she was, she was very young at the time. And, and like I said, what, what we have ultimately are these poems and um, we, after she passed away um, in her fifties, I believe, um, she was finally, they just discovered her family members just discovered this huge, just wealth of poetry that, you know, they knew that she wrote poetry, but had no idea anything mm. like this volume. And so then I think like so often is the case um, in the absence of someone after the fact, um, you're sort of like putting together the pieces of their life, like puzzling through it. And, um, and so that's been the task of so many I mean, people then, her loved ones then, her family, her friends, and then we're still doing that today, trying to sort of piece these poems together to make sense of her own personal journey in life in every sense. But I think um, we kind of do a disservice when we when we freeze her in time as as one of you know the quote the hopeless. Um, because I think she struggled, like she really wrestles with that, um, with questions of who God is and who she is in relation to God, like just, and, and deals with it in a very bold way, I think, through, through her language. She, this notion of a conversation really persists if you read her, her other, um, her other poetry too. And I think that it has sort of a, um, yeah, it's not a straight line journey. She's a no, I'm, I'm not claiming that she was, you know, on, on a steady path all, you know, towards being assured in her faith all the time. I think like most of us realistically, we're, we're always sort of in that conversation and um, cycling through, uh, you know, for whatever the word, the best word might be. Um, yeah, just making sense of the world and that, that conversation can change over time. So I, th I find this really interesting because this is sort of, um, I wanna say this is probably, this is in, in one of the, the classifications as best we can estimate it falls, it's about like 525 um, is the, the poem number. So the poems don't ever have titles. They usually go by whatever the first line is and then they've been numbered mm -hmm. by some people. So um, before this point, you get mostly her sort of, um, it's a little, you know, bold and more of a critique sense. Like she's very much, um, to, you know, sort of criticizing the popular understandings of who and what God is. She's incredibly biblically literate. Like she knows her stuff with the Bible and that can sometimes get missed. I think that her mm. metaphors, her language, her references, her, the stories sometimes, you know, she, she's constantly drawing from biblical mm -hmm text um and i think mm -hmm. anyone who who works with the biblical text a lot is going to um have you know their their understanding of faith is not simple right that the, the bible does not allow us to um uh i guess to be static in our faith mm -hmm. i think that's the beauty of it um and so here there's this really critical time, this moment happening in history, right? That this is the, even though she's in the North, she's in Massachusetts, but the world is changing. Um, the, 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 the civil war is really underway. And she has some friends who have gone off to war. Some of the poems like that they estimate fall right before this are really working through um, some really interesting things to say about like America and liberty and like what is what is liberty and death and um, I should say she's probably the most famous for her the way that she deals with death and um, she's sort of known as like a morbid poet in some ways depending on what your perspective is but I think that actually en uh, enriches the way that she deals with um, 
probably her her faith and how she's like working through that because she's very very inter like interested um and in conversation with her own mortality our mortality too so um at the risk of going on for too long i can i can talk about emily dickinson all day but let's just dive into this um this prayer because i think it's a turning point um mm. and that's not to say that you know it turns on a dime and then stays in a new direction it, it turns several times but this is an interesting one i think um so it begins my period has come for prayer no other art would do my tactics missed a rudiment creator was it you god grows above so those who pray horizons must ascend and so i stepped upon the north to see this curious friend his house was not, no sign had he, by chimney nor by door, could I infer his residence, vast prairies of air, unbroken by a settler were all that I could see. Infinitude, hadst thou no face that I might look on thee. The silence condescended, creation stopped for me, but odd beyond my errand, I worshiped, did not pray. So there's a lot there. Um, and every time I read it, I feel like I get something different out of it, which is uh, as all good poetry does. Um, and I should say, you know, Emily Dickinson can be dense, but that or it can seem sort of intimidating because the way that she uses language, every single word is so packed with meaning and multiple meanings. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a lot like the biblical text in that way too. Um, it, it almost feels like you have to do some exegesis work to get that sure it can seem sort of intimidating because the way that she uses I think that uh, the sound, are we good? Okay. Um, so anyway, the, my period has come for prayer. Her first line sort of, I think sets, sets the tone um, or maybe gives us some insight into where she is in her frame of mind the there's this sort of i think through this poem the, the main themes i see are um this sort of searching for god and making sense of the world you can see her love of nature and creation come through but also sort of putting that in conversation with who the divine is trying to understand up until this point she's been a little bit almost dismissive about those who um were of kind of the traditional sort of congregationalist faith. She kind of criticizes sort of the, um, in some places, the what seems like the traditional understandings of who and what God is. And I think you can see that here, but it's like a different tone. Um, so in this first part, she's realized, you know, my period has come for prayer. No other art would do. So prayer is an art. And she's thinking a lot about poetry all the time. She, she doesn't know quite if she counts as a poet um, or not, which is hilarious, I think, <laughs> now looking back. But because, you know, there weren't really that many women poets and her style is so different than anyone else's at this time. She's really like blazing new trails here, um, even though no one knew that was happening. Um, and so she kind of has an awareness that like, I think that uh, raises the question, like what maybe for us is like, is there a difference between prayer and poetry or like, where is that line? Um, can prayer also be this sort of question of like uh, distilling reality or I can't remember exactly the phrase that dad, that dad used, um, but uh, yeah. How, how does that interplay with what prayer is as well? But the way maybe the way that she prays doesn't quite fit with what she's been told prayer ought to be. So this line, my tactics missed a rudiment. Um, rudiment sort of refers to this sort of like primary lesson, the first lesson, basics, like rudimentary. Um, so maybe she never quite learned how to pray mm -hmm. the way that she feels like you're supposed to um, or other people do. Uh, but, you know, maybe that's okay, I think, because she's never quite done things the way that other people did. Um, 
and then addresses the the creator uh, directly. So creator, was it you? Um, and you know, I think that shift is sort of a mystery. So but take that as you will. Um, my tactics, Mr. Rudiment, creator, was it you? Um, God grows above, so those who pray, horizons must ascend. So God supposedly like lives lives above. Like that's where we we kind of instinctually look for God. That's where we're taught God is, even though God is also very much like in the world around us as well. Um, and again, remembering like the the space that she was in, the context that she was in, um, and what the messages that she was receiving about who and what God was as well. Um, I think she's kind of starting this process of um, searching. And so she's looking, she's looking up. So she's like, okay, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try this, this prayer thing. <laughs> and so I guess the first step is, is the heavens, right? We, we ascend. Um, as she moves up, kind of starts cert this searching that's embodied almost like literally and metaphorically um, looking for his house, um, but finds that maybe, you know, heaven's not quite so concrete as she thought. Another really important piece here is that Emily Dickinson loved science, like she really did. Um, that was one of her favorite things in school. She kept it's part of her love of nature too. Um, and so she was very aware of uh, the like astronomy and um, kind of like the contemporary thoughts and ideas around that and um, the, the universe uh, as a concept, the sort of um, infinitude that we find coming down into this, this second to last chunk here, um, unbroken by a settler, where all that I could see infinitude hath thou no face that I might look on thee. Um, and again, God's, God's residence is vast prairies of air. Um, so I think she's sort of trying to understand, like make sense of who God is and how do you speak to God while knowing like what she knows about the universe, which doesn't quite fit um, at, with what at the time, the kind of traditional images and understandings of God were. Like maybe she didn't feel like she could speak to, to God in, in the way that God had been always presented to her. So she's sort of trying to find God using her own language, using her own perception of the world. She, we have to, so often, um, I think it's important for all of us to sort of find our own ways of knowing God, which requires us to, uh, to find language, to find images. Um, and that's what poetry is too, right? It's mm -hmm. metaphors, it's images, it's finding language. It's a sort of searching on so many levels. Um, and, and I think the, the settler line is really interesting too. Um, unbroken by a settler. She's in the westward expansion period as well. There's all these settlers like moving out west, this sort of idea of, you know, uh, um, quote, uncharted territory. Of course, we know that uh, many people had been living on that land for a long time before the quote settlers were discovering it supposedly for the first time. But um, but she, th this is sort of the conversation that was happening, and and the and space <laughs> that that they were all aware of was completely uncharted. Like we we're sort of learning about it, but didn't understand it. And so God sort of inhabits these vast prairies of air that no settler has reached um, yet. And so she's she's almost like journeying into that space to find God, trying to um, understand. And so. God represents, or God is, I think, infinitude. Like, what is what is God's face um, as infinitude? Who who is God? Like, who are you speaking with? Um, and so, you know, that that I might look on the again direct, directly addressing God again. Um, the silence condescended. Creation stopped for me but odd beyond my errand, I worshiped, did not pray. So 
this is such an interesting piece. <laughs> and I and I want to say I'm not pretending like I know exactly what this means. I think that all of these poems, like like any text, um, are up for interpretation as they should be. And so these are some of the things that I feel like I'm getting out of it right now. But please feel free to get very different things from it as as you should. Um, but I think uh, this question of the silence, um, condescended is often a term that's used for like how God comes to speak to us. That's sort of a traditional theological like term. Um, it, it feels a little funny, I think, to say sometimes because it has other connotations, but this idea that like God condescends to speak to us. Um, but also that when we're speaking to God, when we're praying, sometimes it does feel like that it's the silence that responds um and the, the intentionality with which she capitalizes certain words and not others i think is significance to significant as well um this sort of like divine silence um creation stopped for me and odd beyond my errand so the errand of prayer it is almost like a like if prayer is an errand uh this this you know just asking um mm. as we talked about i think that she what she, she's really responding to that that i think um if you're really going to speak to to god like trying to um, you know searching being in conversation you you finally um faced with the magnitude the infinitude that is like the divine that is God and creation. I wonder whether she has sort of a um, uh, embodied theology in some ways. Um, maybe, it's, yeah. Uh, once, once faced with God, she's like, you. It's, it's not an errand anymore. Like, how can you do anything but worship? And I think she sees the divine really embodied in that sort of like unknown, the vastness, the expanse of um of the universe that she's so uh in love with i think in a lot of ways um and so that's that's sort of where she she finds the divine which is really new i think that that's something that we kind of talk about now but there's a mysticism here that um that was just completely unfamiliar for the time and as i was saying before i just don't think that I think that we do Dickinson a disservice and we do ourselves a disservice when we reduce her and her work and her processing through her, her faith, that conversation with God to uh, just stopping when she's, you know, 18, 19 years old. <laughs> um, we all continue to grow and the, there's so much richness here and her conversation continues. So I, I'd really encourage everyone to keep reading her work. So I'm sorry if I've taken up so much time uh talking about this i should have anticipated that but um oh this is great it's yeah. it's worth it um i love how it's a poem meditating on you know the the errand of prayer that doesn't happen but in the middle it's prayer she's spe she's speaking to you in the middle while talking about herself and mm -hmm. and that and that process mm -hmm. any any comments clover well then we'll move on to the next one after uh it, it, no i think that's it's beautiful i love it um tim do you feel like you got some time here it's 10 we've, we've got a little we got a little time so we can just do a little bit on that i want to make sure we don't go over um just to respect your all's time since we we um <laughs> we lost a bunch of you right at the hour last time so i'm going to um uh i mean right at uh whatever time it is 11 o'clock yeah, in, in yeah so we'll just jump into the next one. This is a, um, and there is a, enough overlap that hopefully it'll be um, easy to kind of talk across them too. This is a this is a quote from Christian Wyman that I'll read first, and I'm just going to say a little bit about him. You can read about him. He is now a faculty member at Yale Divinity School. Clover hasn't had a chance to. Sophie hasn't had a chance to <laughs> study with him yet, but hopefully will. Um, he was raised in a very a uh, conservative religious home with a lot of violence as well. He talks about that, um, left the church, left Christianity and kind of rediscovered, refounded in the in his late thirties 
Um, and soon after that was diagnosed with a, a very rare form of cancer, which he continues to um, face and, and struggle with. Um, and a lot of his poetry is infused with his own experiences of, you know, facing death, of, of, of suffering, of undergoing, um, you know, pretty intense medical procedures and so forth like that. And at the same time, very much grappling with, um, with religion and theology. This is a quote from him from an interview he did with Krista Tippett on, on being, which I encourage you to go and have a listen to. Um, he says, I am convinced that the same God that might call me to sing of God at one time might call me at another to sing of godlessness. Sometimes when I think of all this energy that's going on, all these different people trying to find some way of naming and sharing their belief, I think it may be the case that God calls some people to unbelief in order that faith can take on new forms. So this this dialogue between, you know, praise and godlessness um, going on and that God might give us both of those. I think that's biblical, um, certainly in the Psalms and in the Book of Lamentations and other places, we, 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 that certainly resonates with that. So um, I'm going to go ahead and jump right into this poem. It's fairly short, but I think we'll have to read it twice to make sure we really follow it and then just make a couple quick comments and, and, and that'll do it. Um, so, so here we go. It's called Small Prayer in a Hard Wind. So just listen, and then we'll read it again um, to make sure we're sort of following it. It's all one complex sentence, right, uh, grammatically speaking. And so um, you have to watch for the subject, which comes later. As through a long abandoned half-standing house only someone lost could find, which with its painless windows and sagging cross beams, its hundred crevices in which a hundred creatures hoard and nest, seems both ghost of the life that happened there and living spirit of this wasted place. Wind seeks and sings every wound in the wood that is open enough to receive it. Shatter me, God into my thousand sounds. So if we back up, we see that we've got clauses within clauses. Um, as through a long abandoned half standing house, only someone lost could find, wind seeks and sings every wound in the wood that is opened enough to receive it. Just in the way that wind seeks and sings every wound in the wood of a half abandoned house, shatter me God into a thousand sounds. The whole thing is comparing as, the, as wind going through a house, I want you to go through me as though, so I'm, I'm the house, I'm the old house crevices, cracks, openings, um, blow through me and make sounds in me the same way that wind seeks and sings every wound in the wood that is open enough to receive it, right? So it's a complex poem. I think about a uh, sentence, really. I think about um, that Psalm uh, 42, as the heart longs for flowing streams, so my life, my breath uh, longs for you, O oh God. It's almost like as for longing streams, the heart, the, the deer longs, uh, as, for, as for flowing streams, the deer longs, so my heart uh, longs for you. That's the same sort of structure here, except it's much opened up and, and expanded. Um, in some ways, I think of this as a fairly traditional Kind of, there, there are some traditional biblical echoes in it, right? We're, we're familiar with the idea of a house as a metaphor for the self or as a metaphor for the body, and that's going on here. We're also familiar with wind as God. You know, in Hebrew, ruach means wind, it means breath, and sometimes it's translated also as spirit, but the wind of God moving. So it has those kinds of traditional resonances, but there's also so much more going on. It's, it's this incredibly expanded metaphor, for one thing, 
you, you, when you're reading it, you can almost forget that wind is the subject of that first of everything except the last line. It's wind that's going through the long abandoned house blah, that blah, 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 which blah, 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 blah. Um, and I want you to do that to me in the same way that wind does that in a house, right? Um, so it's this incredibly extended metaphor. I think, and this is what I, I, would, I would love to have more time to talk about, but something for you all to think about. On the one hand, this is, I think this is beautiful, right? It's this image of the house as an instrument that the wind plays. Uh, the holes in the house are like the holes in a, in a clarinet or a flute or something like that, that as the wind blows through it, it makes sounds in any opening that is, any, any hole in the wood that is open enough to receive it. So this notion of the self as a kind of instrument that makes music as God blows through oneself, as God moves through oneself. So it's beautiful in that way, the sort of notion, uh, that kind of image like that. But at the same time, there's a violence to it um, because the music that God makes in us is made possible by the wounds in us that are open enough to receive God's movement. And in fact, in that last line, what the, what the voice is saying is, shatter me into my thousand sounds, right? Well, my thousand sounds are my thousand wounds, right? This is, the, the wounds are the, are, the, are the spaces in which the wind blow, the holes in the house and the wounds in the person are the, are the spaces that the wound in the wood that is open enough to receive God's movement. So, um, I think while it's beautiful on one hand, it's also this sort of image, I think, that of, of this God that really um, is kind of relentless, is a hard, is a hard wind, a movement that keeps opening me up to the world and uh, through my own pain, that makes me sing in some sense through my own, my own wounds. And, um, I think there's just something very profound about that and almost overwhelming about it. You can miss it in the complexity of the grammar of it, but when you slow down and unpack that, you realize that the metaphor of the house with the, with the holes, with the wounds in the wood is, is the self with the wounds and my sounds that God sort of, you know, is able to resonate in me or, 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 or to sound in me are, are, are because of my, my woundedness. There's a beautiful line at the very end of um, one of my favorite essays by Annie Dillard from Pilgrim at Tinker Creek, or is it Tinker at Pilgrim Creek? I can never remember which one it is, but at the very end of the one, Pil of the essay, Pilgrim at Tinker Creek. Yeah. There you go. The Tinker one Creek. at um, the very end of the line, uh, end of the, of the essay called Seeing, um, she, she says, maybe all of this time I was a bell and I never realized it, I'm paraphrasing, until I was struck. It wasn't until I was struck that I realized I was a bell. And there's something about that with this too, of the, the self as this instrument that something from outside of it, you know, works with its own wounds and its own, its own history in order to make music. And he wants that. He's not running away from that. He wants to be exposed and opened and, and cracked open in that way. I'll stop there if anyone has thoughts or if we want to sum up in our in the last minute. Yeah. Well my just one response to this um, is that though this half standing house, I mean what what would have made this house half standing and wounded is the wind. Right. So the wind so it's the wind isn't only blowing through it the wind has caused some of this yeah good, good. so there's both like both that. uh both uh yeah anyway yeah yeah the wind opens those holes in some sense right mm -hmm. and is blows blows us over and mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. yeah um it's 11 so do you have a comment here um, to this one <laughs> I mean, and I, I hope you get to take him, Christian Wyman. I hope. Yeah, I hope so too. Um, I've come close a couple times, but 
those darn Presbyterian ordination requirements, you know, <laughs> you take totally. time. so someday <laughs> I'll have enough space for the elective I want. Um, yes. Yeah. Uh, I mean, this is an incredible poem and I, I love it. I love the, the breaking. And I think, again, I'm filtering everything through my questions about what our reformed faith is, but I think that that <laughs> also speaks to something, uh, something in that, that, um, yeah, that made the open wounds being the, the places where God reaches us, God touches us. And then I sort of wondered about the, the shattering as the thousand sounds, um, like the, the sound of the breaking is the prayer itself. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Mm -hmm. There's this, yeah, this annihilation of ego or, you know, in poetry and in prayer, that it's not just petition, it's not just asking, but you bring this mm. deep humility and woundedness um, before, mm -hmm. before the divine. Well, um, as people are getting off, so we want to uh, thank everyone for coming. Thank you to so much, you two too. And um, Tim, any uh, any heads up about next week before we go? Well, uh, we're planning on uh, focusing on music, and music. I think actually contemporary, probably for the, for the most part this time, not nineteenth century. But um, uh, uh, yeah, so we don't know exactly what we're going to do yet, but. Um, <laughs> It'll be kind of along the same lines, thinking about, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, music as a, as as poetry and as prayer. Yeah, great. Um, if you all want to say your goodbyes on the chat, that would be awesome. And really, uh, we're so grateful for joining for you all joining us this morning. Have a blessed day um, and uh, go in peace to love and serve the Lord.